we want to be as a church. Just like Jesus, we want to reach people one at a time. You'll find that this is the way Jesus changed the world, one person at a time. Southeast Online. Welcome everyone. I'm Christy and y'all know Stephen. Today we begin a new series that will guide us all the way to Easter. Yeah, and it's spring forward today, which means we moved ahead the clocks one hour. And so we lost an hour of sleep last night. So I want you to be honest. If you're joining us for the first time on Southeast Online because you messed up your clock situation and you missed your regular on-campus location, will you let us know? Be brave. Yeah, yeah. Share that because <laughs> yeah. that's just kind of fun. Don't be afraid to jump in and interact with us today. We've got chat hosts on every platform. They're ready to engage with you, to answer your questions, pray for you, and get you connected to everything happening on here. Yeah, and please take a second and uh, share SE Online with your the people in your circle. Like, you could actually literally invite someone to watch with you, but also across your platforms, click share and invite others to join in. You don't want to do it alone because here's the thing. You may not believe me, but we actually have stories already coming back to us where uh, someone was on their social media and someone they knew had shared it and it was exactly what they needed at that moment and they're reconnecting with God because of a share. So help us out. We, we love to hear about oh, those stories. Oh my goodness, yes. I love how God is at work in just so many unique ways. Absolutely. Today we begin the brand new sermon series called Reverse the Curse and each week the messages are coming right out of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Yeah, and it's gonna point us to Jesus. It's so good. Uh, this morning to get us set up for the series, we're actually right now gonna check in with Senior Pastor Kyle Eidelman to find out more what to expect in this series. Hey, thanks, Stephen and Christy. I am excited about this new series we're kicking off this weekend. It's called Reverse the Curse, and it's going to lead us into Easter. And I think most of us know what it's like to feel like we just can't get ahead, that everything is working against us. We take one step forward, but then it's two steps back. And what we're going to be talking about in this series is that so much of our struggle in life is rooted in sin and that Jesus came to reverse the curse of sin. He is the curse reverser. He makes things new and right. He takes things that are broken and makes them into something beautiful. So we're going to be celebrating that together as a church family, uh, that God wants to do that for us through Jesus. He wants to do it for us as a church, but he wants to do it for each of us individually. So glad you're joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in as we see how Jesus can reverse the curse of sin in our lives. Yeah, this is going to be a great series leading us all the way up to Easter. I'm excited about it. But what's going to be tempting is that you're going to be hearing the story of Adam and Eve, and you're going to be tempted to think it's their story. But I think the parallel is going to come through where we realize that it's also all of our stories. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've all got something in our past that crushed us. Yeah. If we're honest, we're all a little bit broken. Yeah. And perhaps that's why you joined us today online. You're feeling the weight of life. Yeah, and if that's you, what I want you to know and what we want you to know as a church family, you're in the right spot. Uh, that Southeast Online is a great place for you, but also this is the series for you, Reverse the Curse, meaning it's going to be filled with hope. Yeah. It's going to be f pointing you to how we can reverse the curse of being broken and feeling shame. Yeah, and shame is so powerful. It is. If I'm candid, it's something I battle. I think many of you are held back by shame. Um, I think shame can be a part of a lot of stories, and I know it was for Iris. Yeah. So I'd like for you to watch just a little bit and check out how shame has impacted Iris. Shame to me is a feeling that just weighs you down and you feel unworthy. You feel embarrassed. You feel like you've just done something horribly wrong and you don't know why. For me personally, I feel like, well, if I can't tell anybody else, how do I tell God? Because he, he's God. He's, he's so much bigger than everybody else. And if I can't tell even like my best friend, how do I tell the creator of the universe? Uh, this is just a kind of a preview of a full story. If you stay tuned to the very end today, we'll air the full interview with Iris and, and she'll tell her full story. It's a powerful testimony to what God can do through us and how he can make an impact uh, in our shame story that we all have. So stay tuned to the very end today. 
Yeah, we want you to know that healing comes from God. And that's why we're talking about this. That's why reverse the curse is so important. It's healing that changes lives. Yeah, and I'm always I'm always humbled by how God is at work, uh, both individually and together, like kind of corporately. Um, and so uh, it's, it's awesome to see God at work there. We also see how God's at work right now. Uh, and this is hard to believe. I've got friends now in South Africa, and today uh, they are in Stellenbosch, South Africa, just outside of Cape Town, and we have our a watch party that's kicking off right now, uh, and we're just excited that they're a part of our SE Online family right that's now. That's amazing yeah. and cool. I want to say hi to Chris and Darren. Steven's told me all about you guys. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, and if you're there with Chris and Darren at Base Camp, we are excited. I just want to give you a personal welcome and say uh, we're glad that you're here. Yes, and to everyone else, who else wants to throw a watch party? We would love to help you wherever you are. All you have to do to get started is just text watch party to 733-733 or just send us an email. Yeah, a watch party is just one way to bring your community of people together to take in the live stream of SC Online together. We'll help you out. That's right. Thanks for making SE Online a part of your day today. Yeah, and I'll catch you after service today. And don't forget to stick around to hear Iris' story. We'll see you guys at the end. Bye. Church, everyone joining us online. We're so glad you're here this morning. We invite you to worship with us. Put your hands together. Come on, let's see.
name is Taylor. I'm the worship pastor at our Indiana campus. But man, it's so good to be here with you this morning in the house of God. Man, I'm excited to worship. And like Matt said, we're gonna learn a new song together this weekend. I'm really excited about this because we're learning it across all of our campuses. And it's a song that aligns with the heart of this series we're stepping into, Reverse the Curse, which is really just a way to look at the way that when Jesus came and, and he came to save us and he went to the cross and he died, and then three days later when he rose again, this song is just a reminder of the power that that cross and the resurrection possess. And that from that moment forward that as we step into relationship with Jesus, the curse of sin is being reversed and undone in our own lives. Amen? Amen. And that the mourning turns into dancing and weeping turns into celebration and praise and victory because in Jesus, everything is good. And as we put our trust in him, truth is revealed to us. And through that truth, we step into freedom. And one day that will be realized in heaven. But until that day, we make a conscious effort to say, God, this is what you've done for me. And I thank you and I praise you for it. Amen. So we're gonna learn this song together. It's a simple song. We wanna teach you the chorus, if that's okay. And then we invite you to sing along as it catches. This is one we're gonna lean into for this series. And just so excited for our church to wrap their hands and their hearts around this song to sing it together. The chorus goes like this. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing that again. Come on. Sing along.
Well, good morning, church. My name is Mason, and I am thrilled this morning. I, I serve in men's ministry here, and we've got 21 men in the baptistry this morning. Yeah. 11, 11 of these guys are being baptized, so fellas. Uh, in, in John 14, Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. He declares that he's the means for us as men being restored to the Father. Uh, and so I get excited for your profession of faith this morning, you uh, and his atoning death and, and uh, resurrection that you get to be brought into new life with him. We celebrate that. Uh, but before we do, I'd ask you to confess that truth with me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. Son of the living God. My Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. Come on, Jalen. This is my man, Jalen. Uh, and Jalen's got a story um, that proves uh, the Lord's ability to work within suffering to draw his children, his sons near to him and to use them. So, uh, Jalen, I'm proud of you, bro. I'm excited for you. I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. My name's Mike, and this is my friend Brad. Brad and I knew each other from the gym, not very well, and Brad was going through some personal struggles, and the Lord asked me to reach out to him, to help, see if I could talk to him, listen to him, and I did. And since then, he has brought us closer to God. We continue to walk the journey, and I'm so happy and proud of him here to be here today. Brad, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. church. Uh, my name is Kyle. This is my friend Justin Shadows. We were brought together through Orphan Care Alliance, and uh, Justin's on a journey. He turns 18 next week, and uh, there's no bigger party than the party in heaven for you today. God's got his hand on you. You have a perfect father in the Lord, and you now have a family forever. It's the family of God. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, church family. Uh, this is Chris. My name's Kerry. Tell Tim to this turn and look over at Kim's mom. Four of my sons that is the greatest sons God could ever give a man. But uh, Chris has been thinking about this for such a long time, and I'm just so glad he's here today to, to finish this journey. So, Chris, in uh, 3 John 4, it says that I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. And for that, I, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mike Paspume and his son Zach. I've had the privilege of knowing Zach for 21 years since he was three and grew up with our girls. And first people we met, we moved to Louisville. And uh, I've watched him grow up in a great church right here at Southeast. I've watched him go to private Christian school. And, and like me and many, many of you out there, thought he was missing something. That's just a lie because we have everything we need in Jesus. And he is the Luke 15, the prodigal has come home. So we rejoice with all the angels in heaven with you today, Zach. Because of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tony, this is my brother Aaron. Aaron, this morning, I, I love to hear that you said you're preparing for your future through this baptism, and you realize that Jesus Christ is your future. 
And I'm so proud of you, man. Because you're confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. sisters. This is Zane Larson. Um, I've seen him come so far. I'm happy for him. Um, he's going to do great things for the Lord. i um, just honored to have part in this. Baptize you in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What's up, church? Yeah. What a group of guys, right? Well, I've known this fellow my entire life, Brian Wingfield. And, uh, you know, we grew up together since we were Little League baseball players. We've played baseball all over the country. We've seen ourselves at our highs. We've seen ourselves at our lows. Right now, man, we're working a program that allows us to lean into Jesus because of that is how we overcome. And look at, and look at where he led us. Look at where we landed. And it's because of that, man, I love you now, and I promise you, and I give you my word, that I'll walk out the rest of my life with you, all right? Now, you think this roar's loud? There's a roar in heaven louder than this, all right? So now I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right here is my brother Adam. I've been walking with Adam for like, I don't know, eight years or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, we walked not with Jesus, and now we walk with Jesus. <laughs> and it's just beautiful seeing what God's doing and where he's going to take you. And just put your faith and trust in him, and God's going to use you in music and all kinds of things. I'm just so proud of you because you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Last shall be first, and the first shall be last. That's right. <laughs> and this is my brother Casey. Uh, Casey's part of our music studio downtown. And uh, Casey, the same thing with you. I'm just so proud of what God's doing through you and you. And just, just keep putting him first. He's setting you free from all the things. It's the prodigal son, y'all, right here. Thank you. Thank you for your faith. I'm talking to you, Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk to you. In the name of the Father, the Son. my dudes just got baptized. That's, I'm loving that. Uh, well, this week I was thinking about this and uh, I thought it was oh, just something I wanted to share with you. I was noticing this thing and I was out in a public place and I was watching um, these dads uh, yelling at their kids, right? Like just yelling. Anybody grow up with a yeller? Well, is that okay? Can I say that? Anybody around a yeller? It doesn't have to be your dad, but just around one and they're just, it's just loud. And, and I remember one of my, my, my boys kind of grabbed me and said, dad, you know, Man, uh, you know, dad's, a good dad just shouldn't yell. I was like, well, or you should just be good. Like, that's an option, at least. And uh, so we were talking about it and, it, and it just dawned on me. It was something I wanted to share with you. And I thought, you know, it isn't interesting. That, uh, there, there is a time for a good dad to yell and to shout, right? I mean, like it, when there's, you know, we're talking about prodigals. When there's a 
distant child who is being disobedient. And you know that the only way to get their attention is to, is to yell at them because you know that their disobedience is gonna wreck their lives. And that's what a good father does. When there's imminent danger coming, and you know it's in a street, there's a truck coming, there's a bus coming, and, and you know as a good father, I've got to intervene, I've got to shout, I've got to yell. Sometimes a good father will sit in the stands and yell at his son, yell at his daughter, okay, great job, great job. You need to box out, son. But you just cheer him on. But it just dawned on me as we were chatting about that, how many of us have heard his shout, but sometimes how few of us hear his whisper. It's a powerful thing. It's one thing to always hear his yell because we're being disobedient and we're distant. It's another thing to hear his shout because we recognize that a train is headed for our life. It's the only way for him to intervene. It's another thing to sometimes live for his approval from the stands, but there is something different when you get that gentle whisper of a father who's just walking with you. And I love in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50, verse four, it says this, it's Isaiah talking about his relationship with the father. And he says, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the words that sustain the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my, my ear to listen like one being taught. In the middle of that, it's like this father-son relationship where he's like, when you get his whisper, he gives you words, he gives you, he calls out talents in you, he calls out giftings in you, he calls out his heart in you. There's something powerful about the whisper of a father. And so many of us settle for a shout. So today, I just wanna invite you during this time, whether you're in the room or we've got online people right now, uh, watching in from a whole bunch of different places. I just wanna invite you in. This is an opportunity right now, y'all, to lean into his whisper. If you put your faith and trust in Christ as we celebrate communion, I just wanna, I just wanna encourage you, not just now, but regularly, let's, let's just lean into his whisper. Let's do that as we celebrate communion together.
Uh, this week, we are starting a new series called Reverse the Curse, and it's gonna take us into Easter. I wanna kind of plant a seed asking you all to be thinking about friend, family member, neighbor that you can buy Easter weekend. I was reading research that said that if someone doesn't go to church but they're invited to an Easter service by someone they personally know, there's an 82% chance that they'll come. That's pretty good. 82% chance if somebody you personally know who doesn't go to church, if you invite them, 82% chance that they'll show up. So what a great opportunity for us to impact this community, giving people an opportunity to get a glimpse of the faith, the freedom, the hope, the healing that we have in Jesus. It's gonna be a great, it's gonna be a great weekend. It's an exciting weekend for us as a church because we're also launching our Bullet County campus Easter weekend. And um, love seeing what God is doing in Bullet County. In fact, they're having a worship night at the end of this month. And they already have 500 plus people who've said, hey, we're gonna come to that worship night. If you're gonna be a part of the Bullitt County campus, if you're gonna attend that campus on Easter weekend, here's what I would love to ask you to do is to go to the website and RSVP. That'll help us be prepared for everyone that'll come. Uh, we can't wait to see what God is gonna do there. Um, a few other things I wanna mention to you. Uh, we, every weekend, we do live streaming services uh, on Sunday, throughout the day on Sunday. We have thousands of people that join us from around the world. I just want to make sure you know that in case um, you're traveling or maybe you have to stay home and you're sick, then would you join us online as part of our Southeast online community? It is amazing to see what God is doing in that space. I mean, online, you can worship and you can give online, you can be a part of a group online, uh, you can be prayed for online. So if for some reason you can't be here, um, we just wanna make sure that you know that you're invited to join us online. Really cool story, a couple of weeks ago, a family from Wisconsin drove 12 hours to be here on a Sunday morning because uh, Greg Wheeler of the Wheeler family in Wisconsin, Greg was ready to be baptized and they wanted to baptize him at the Blankenbaker campus and so they drove 12 hours, Greg was baptized, they drove 12 hours back to Wisconsin. They're joining us now, like right now. So, um, we are, Loving what God is doing at a small town in Wisconsin. Now, this is cool. So they, they're building this house, getting ready to move into it, and they have this room that they've designed with um, this idea in mind of inviting people in their community to join them, uh, to gather with them on the, the weekends, to join them as they watch and, and connect through Southeast Online. They call their house uh, the church, their new house, is, they're calling it the church house. And so love seeing surprising ways that God is at work. This weekend, like, this Sunday in South Africa, just outside of Cape Town, we have a, a, a watch party that's taken place. So Chris in South Africa, uh, I know you've gathered together with people in your community at your place of business and you're worshiping with us from South Africa. I just wanna welcome you. Uh, that's, that's really, that's, a, that's an incredible time to live. Lots of good things happening around the world. And yet, there's this virus. <laughs> I mean, we're reminded of the fact that we live in what we would call a fallen world, that the world sometimes feels like it's under a curse. You're aware of that, I'm guessing, in some of the small ways of life. Like, for example, how else do you explain it except for a, a curse is on us, that everything that tastes really good is bad for you. I mean, that's, that's part of the curse, I think. And now you go to restaurants and they put the calorie count of whatever you wanna order in the menu just to remind you, you're cursed. Like you can enjoy it, but you're paying a price. Or um, how else do you explain it except for a curse that you can take cords from like a phone or charger and you can wind them up nicely and neatly, put them in a drawer and shut the drawer and come back a few days later and they've all gotten together like they it's tangled up, it's all knotted up. There's some dark forces at work in our cord drawer. How else do you explain it? Or, or what about the mystery of missing socks? Like what happens? How, how does that 
happen? You take both socks off, you put them in the laundry, and then you pull it out of the laundry, and there's one sock. And so here's my theory, I don't know. Hopefully none of us will find out. I think in the hell, there's this room full of single socks. Like, it's the devil's work, he's just going around taking single socks. We have these reminders that the system is broken, doesn't work the way we think it should, and I, I celebrated a birthday this past week. I say, so, really, at some point you stop celebrating, you start tolerating. But one of the gifts I got was nose hair clippers. Because apparently in high def on a big screen, they show up. I, to me, this is the curse. Curse of sin is the relentless nature of nose hair. As you get older, all these, all these reminders, and sometimes it's a lot more serious, a lot a lot scarier, so we read about the coronavirus that dominates the news, and as a church, like many organizations, we're paying close attention to what the CDC recommends, and we're going to extra efforts to make sure everything is sanitized and, and clean, and we're implementing some other uh, approaches just to, just to make sure we got all of our bases covered, but it's, it's a little crazy. I read, I read this week, don't know if it's true, that corona beer do you read this? They're offering health care officials $15 million to change coronavirus to the Bud Light virus. And it just spread quickly. And so some numbers for you. Around the world, there's around 100,000 confirmed cases. There's around 300 cases in the United States. The death count in the United States is uh, at, last time I checked, was at 17. Um, but consider the fact that even in the past six months that the regular flu, influenza, within the United States has infected 45 million people and 45,000 people have died from the flu or flu-related causes. And not to mention last year, worldwide, there were more than eight million people who died of cancer, more than two million people who died from HIV AIDS, more than 10 million children worldwide who died from poverty, or preventable disease. The leading cause of death worldwide is abortion at 40 million. There are more than 200 million orphans in the world. More than 800 million people will go to bed hungry tonight, but 40% of the food that's produced in the world rots away uneaten. There are 300, 350 million people who would describe themselves as feeling depressed, and that number's probably going up even during the intro of this sermon. That number's probably going up. <laughs> it feels a little bit overwhelming, and we're just reminded that there must be some kind of curse. You can look just even closer to home if you read the headlines. Tornado in Nashville. A family of three, among others, are killed. The remains of a 15-month-old are found. <laughs> Growing number of, of teenagers describe themselves, identify themselves as Nazis. And so you, you, you read this stuff in the news, you see these numbers. I don't know how you react to that, but how I react is it's, it's not supposed to be this way. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. Which then begs the question what's the problem? What, what is the problem? How do you explain it? I read this story about a college professor, law professor, who at the very beginning of class on the first day puts two numbers up on the chalkboard. So puts an eight and a four up on the chalkboard and then he asks his students for answers to the eight and the four. And so the students began to shout out answers. Somebody says, um, 12. He says, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. Someone else, the multiplication, 32. Well, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. Four, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. And then the professor explains to his students, you keep giving me answers, but you can't give me the right answer without knowing the problem. You have to know the problem before you can give a solution. And I think what we tend to do culturally is we see the numbers on the board and we think, what's the answer? 
and somebody shouts out, politics. <laughs> well, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. Healthcare, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. Education, well, you're not wrong, but that's not the right answer. Economy, you're not wrong, it's not the right answer. See, in order to have the right answer, you have to know what the problem is. You can't just look at the numbers on the board and start throwing out answers and solutions. You gotta know what the problem is. And to understand the problem, you gotta go back to the beginning. And so we wanna start in Genesis chapter two as we kick off this series. In Genesis chapter two, we read that God has created everything, everything is good, and he gives one command to Adam in Genesis chapter two, verse 16. He says to Adam, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, what about this? How about we don't plant that tree? <laughs> That's an idea. Let's just not have it in the garden at all. So why? Why does God have the tree? Well, the tree represents the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. Because you can't have true fellowship, you can't really have an intimate relationship, a close relationship with someone if, if rejection isn't an option. You have to have some choice in it, and so the tree represents, do I choose God or do I not? And verse 16 is an important verse because it starts with these words, you are what? You are free. You're free. You're free to eat of any of these trees, just not this one. The point being that God didn't create this impossible environment where they were restricted. Instead, he said, you're free. You're free to live. You're free to enjoy yourself. But here's the one thing that I would ask as a way to choose me that you don't eat of this one tree. If you eat of this one tree, you will surely die. And then chapter two ends with this really beautiful statement. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. You know what that's like? You don't, neither do I. Like this is the only time that that's ever happened. Where a man and a woman stood naked before God and before each other and felt complete freedom. And then chapter three begins and says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made and he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say that? Is that really what he said? I don't know how he asked the question. Like, I don't know the inflection. Like, did he just cast some doubt? Hey, did God say you must not eat of any tree? I can't remember. Or, or did he say it with an attitude? When I picture a talking snake, they tend to have a bit of an attitude. Are you kidding me? Did God say not to eat of any tree in the garden? I think what's happening here is the enemy is trying to get Eve to question the goodness of God. Because if you can question, if you can believe the lie that God is not a good father who can be trusted, then it leads to all kinds of sin. And so notice what the enemy does. He takes God's restriction and he applies it to everything. Makes God sound like he's overly restrictive. Did God say you can't eat of any tree? No, God didn't say that. He said one tree. He's trying to make Eve believe that she's missing out, that God's holding out. And, and Eve says in verse two and three, it says, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat, fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not, what? Touch it, you must not touch it, or you will die. Did God say that? No, God didn't. God never said you couldn't touch it. Now the Bible says that sin entered the world through one, not one woman, through one man, Adam. But it says that Eve was deceived. So I don't, I don't know, maybe Adam because Eve wasn't there when God gave the command. Maybe Adam didn't do a good job of explaining it. Sometimes men aren't great at communication. So maybe that's what happened. But she says that God, God said they couldn't touch it. So here's, here's what happens. The enemy takes a restriction that God gives and makes it 
apply to everything. And Eve says, well, no, that's not right. God said we couldn't touch it. And so she rejects what he says, but she takes a step towards him. And you have God's restriction, but when we take God's restriction and get more restrictive, it has a way of leading to rebellion. Some of you know that, because that's the kind of home or church or school you grew up in. Like God has some restrictions because he loves you and he cares about you, and so he was very clear about those. And perhaps some well-meaning people in your life took God's restrictions and said, "Mm, let's get even more restrictive than God's restrictions. And when you get more restrictive than God's restrictions, it has a way of turning into rebellion. And so God's restriction about dressing modestly is a good restriction. But then we get restrictive about that. Start applying it, judging people given arbitrary restrictions around it. The Bible says not to get drunk. Don't get drunk. It's a good restriction. But we get restrictive about God's restriction. So, you know, you can't take NyQuil because the alcohol content is pretty high. There's some weird stuff. God says to avoid sexual immorality. Out of his love for us, he gives us this restriction. But we get more restrictive with his restrictions. And so we say, well, no dancing. No dancing. I have a buddy who kind of grew up in that type of restrictive environment. And he said, I thought the reason it was wrong to have sex outside of marriage is that it might lead to dancing. <laughs> like that's, that's how he understood it. And when we, when we decide we're going to get more restrictive about God's restrictions, it just has a way of leading to rebellion. Verse 4, it says this. The serpent said to Eve, you will not surely die. Now keep in mind, Adam and Eve had no context for death. They'd never seen it, experienced it, witnessed it. Nothing had ever died. You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, kind of. I mean, kind of. See, this is what the enemy does. He knows that the best lies have some truth to them. And so he gives you some truth, but he leaves out a lot of, a lot of context. He shows you the bait, but he hides the hook. And so he says, yeah, your eyes will be open. Yeah, your eyes will be open. But he doesn't tell them where that is going to lead. It reminds me of the medications you see advertised on TV where there's some commercial that uh, is introducing a new pharmaceutical product that's gonna clearly solve whatever problem you might have. And, and in the commercial, people are so happy about it. Like you feel like, even if I don't have that problem, I need to try that, I need to talk to my doctor. And so in the commercial, you have people running through fields. Music is playing. There's like a golden retriever bouncing along as they talk to you about how this is, this is what you need. And then how's the commercial end? Like just all side effects. Just really quickly, just want to tell you everything this is possibly going to do to you should you take this medication. And and so I came across this uh, satire article, kind of making fun of this trend, Um, and it was an advertisement for a medication uh, to uh, address joint pain. The direction said take two tablets every six hours for joint pain, and then it gave the side effects. This drug may cause joint pain, may cause (laughs) nausea, headache, or shortness of breath. You may experience muscle aches, rapid heartbeat, impotence, and ringing in the ears. If bowel movements become greater than 12 per hour, consult your doctor. (laughs) You may find yourself becoming lost or vague, may may cause stigmata in Ukrainians. You may feel a powerful sense of impending doom. Do not take this product if you're uneasy with a locked jaw. This drug may shorten your intestines by 21 feet. Women experience a lowering of the voice and an increase in ankle hair. Sensations of levitation are illusory, as is the sensation of having a phantom third arm. 20 minutes after taking the pills, you will feel an insatiable craving to take another dose. Avoid this with all your power. And and this this is how the enemy works. He says, hey, here's, here's a solution to your problem, if you, if, you just, if you just take a bite of this, your eyes will be opened. Well, yeah, they will. But he doesn't tell you what 
you're gonna see. He doesn't tell you where it leads. He doesn't mention the psychological trauma. I see a lot of women deal with after an abortion. He doesn't mention uh, the feeling of being used or the feeling of using somebody. When you sleep with someone you're not committed to, Lee leaves that out. He doesn't talk about how sexual sin can come back and haunt your marriage years later. He doesn't say anything about regret, the regret you feel when you're sitting across the table from your adult children and they're letting you know that you were not there for them when they needed you. He doesn't talk to you about the anxiety of wondering when your boss is gonna catch on I'm wondering if your spouse is gonna find out. Doesn't mention any of that. He leaves out all the side effects. Doesn't talk to you about addiction and how it's gonna define your life and dominate your existence for years. Genesis chapter three, verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her. He's, Hey, why don't you say something, buddy? Like, you, your wife's talking to a snake. <laughs> Seems like you might want to speak up. He was with her, and he ate it. And this is the moment that sin enters the world, and since then, the world has been under the curse of sin. So very much like a virus, if you think of it that way, sin entered the world through Adam, and the virus spread and the infection spread to everyone and to everything. Romans chapter five, verse 12 puts it this way. When Adam's sin, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. I'm infected, you're infected. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans says. We've all sinned. I remember when I first became aware of my infection, my sin infection, my sin nature. I was in the second grade. And in second grade, your social status is somewhat determined by who's the fastest in the class. And at least for the second grade, I was the fastest boy in the class. Fastest boy. Wasn't the fastest. <laughs> Tressa Roberts <laughs> was the fastest. But I was the fastest boy, and I'd never go head to head with Tressa in a foot race. I'm not gonna do that. So it's, you know, boys would race, girls would race, and, and yet we would play this game at recess called... Um, Freeze tag, boys chase girls. And I would try to catch Tressa, and she was always a half a step ahead of me. I could never quite, I could never quite catch her. And then one day we were playing freeze tag, and she was just ahead of me a little bit. I couldn't get her. I could, couldn't reach her. But she was running so fast that her ponytail was just flying back at me, <laughs> just, just mocking me. And I realized I can't get her. I can get her ponytail. And I, without thinking, I just felt that pride and jealousy. And I grabbed her ponytail. And I yanked it. And she fell backwards. I started crying. I immediately thought, what have I done? And just ran away to hide. And I went to hide in the corner of the gym where there was a group of students that played the clapping games. Did you have students like this? They'd just clap to like Cinderella dressed in yellow. Did, did you do that? I'm embarrassed that I could say that whole thing for you, but I went, to hide among, I went to hide among the clappers. I thought, they're not gonna look for me. They're not gonna look for me in the clapper colony. I'll dwell amongst the clappers as long as I have to. And so I, I was hiding in the clapper section and uh, I just had my head down, heart was pounding. And then I saw Mrs. Cruz, who was my kindergarten first grade teacher, go over to Teresa who was on the ground and, and she knelt down next to her. And I thought, Teresa, please don't tell, don't tell Mrs. Cruz. I'm, I'm one of her favorites, don't tell her what I did. And then she stands up and she starts, Mrs. Cruz starts looking around. Put my head back down. 
bell rang, I ran to the second grade classroom, and I sat at my desk, I thought, what? why would I do that? You ever think that? Why, why did I do that? Why did I think I could get away with it? Why'd you have to cry? There's no crying in freeze tag. It's... <laughs> and what kind of name is Tressa? <laughs> Start blaming her. Mrs. Cruz comes to the uh, second grade classroom and tells my second grade teacher that she needs to see me in the hallway. Oh, I'd never had to go to the hallway before. I'd seen other kids <laughs> go to the hallway. And when I saw other kids go to the hallway, I'd be like, you know, thank you, God, that I'm not like those kids. <laughs> Hallway dwellers. And so I, I went out to the hallway. My feet felt heavy. I'm having trouble breathing. I get out there. Mrs. Cruz bends down, looks me in the eye. Do you have something to tell me? No. <laughs> did, you, did you pull Tress's hair? No. And then I started crying, which I don't think is what people do when they're innocent. <laughs> and, and she said, I'd be disappointed if you pulled her hair, but I'd be even more disappointed if I thought you would lie to me. And I, I wanted to tell the truth, but I, I felt like I was in too deep. The best thing in my mind was to just keep hiding. I doubled down. Well, I didn't pull her hair, but I did reach out to tag her, and when I reached out to tag her, she turned her head, and her ponytail got caught in my hand. <laughs> and I don't wanna make it sound like it was all her fault, And I could tell she was skeptical, but she couldn't really say too much. And she said something about, well, God knows the truth. And I went back to my desk feeling pretty good. I thought, oh, I got out of that. Got away with that. But then something happened the next morning. During kindergarten, first grade, I'd get out of carpool. My mom would take me to school. I'd get out of carpool, and Mrs. Cruz would be at the door. I'd give her a hug. She'd hug me. But on that next morning, I got out of carpool and I saw her standing at this door and I went around to the other door. And when I'd see her in a hallway, I'd walk by quickly, try and take a different route if possible. And at recess, instead of uh, playing tag, I just sat up in the bleachers, just watching other kids play tag. I thought I could get away with it, but the minute I sinned, even though no one else knew about it, it started creating separation. It started to sever relationships in ways that I didn't want it to. But the shame I felt caused me to avoid Mrs. Cruz and stop playing with my buddies. And my guess is that that for some of you, that this is the game you've been playing with God for a while. Just trying to hide, trying to avoid. The sin separates. Next week, Albert Tate's gonna be here and he's, he's gonna talk about one of the consequences of sin. Part of the curse is that sin causes conflict between us, particularly men and women. Conflict and confusion. And from the moment Adam and Eve sinned, they knew something was different. It says in Genesis 3, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. They covered themselves with, with fig leaves. It's a, big, it's a big leaf in the Middle East, big, big fig leaf. Never tried to do this, don't plan on it, but I gotta think that covering your naked body with leaves is, um, is inadequate. Like I, I, I bet you, you still feel pretty self-conscious. And so they hide even more. Their shame just causes them to, to try and cover up. And shame tells me I, shame tells me I'm, um, I'm strong enough. I don't need any help. Shame drives me away from people who care about me. Shame makes me blame people instead of deal with my own failures. Shame tells me I need to look perfect without appearing like I've made any effort. And shame is deathly afraid of failures being found out and of people knowing and talking about it. 
Shame makes me sensitive and take, makes me take rejection personally. Shame tells me I'm not enough and I never will be, and shame tells me I never do enough. Shame tries to convince me that I am my mistakes, that God doesn't love me and he certainly doesn't like me. So they cover up and hide. Verse eight says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. I was afraid and, and so I hid from you and this is, what, this is what shame does. And so we try to cover ourselves up, we try to hide, try to hide behind good deeds and, and accomplishments and college degrees. We, we have these fig leaves that we try to use so that nobody will notice. We're hoping we can get by that we're not exposed. And we try to hide behind religion and appearance. Shame tells me that the best thing to do is to pretend when I don't measure up. But it doesn't work. Fig leaves don't work. If that's how you're trying to deal with your shame, it's not how God wants you to live. He wants to free you from that. There's a beautiful verse here at the end of Genesis chapter three, verse 21. It said, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he, he clothed them. So think about just the grace in this, y'all. Like, because of sin, they are covering themselves in these itchy, uncomfortable fig leaves. It's because they disobeyed God. But what does God do? He gives them, he gives them fur. He covers them in skins. How did he get the skins? An animal. An animal had to die. First time anything had died. An animal shed its blood to cover the sin and shame of mankind. Does that remind you of another story? It's pointing us to Jesus, the curse reverser, who's gonna come in the New Testament, he's gonna sacrifice his life, as the Lamb of God is gonna shed his blood so that his righteousness can cover our sin and shame, so we can walk out in confidence in the presence of God and one another, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done for us. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter five, verse 12, it says, sin entered the world through Adam, verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. You're made righteous. Jesus covers us with his righteousness. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, you don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to hide. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So every time you read the news and every time you're reminded of the curse, tell yourself it's not supposed to be this way and then ask what's the problem and just be reminded that the problem is, it's not an educational problem. If it was, God would have sent a teacher. It's not a political problem. If it was, God would have sent a king or politician. It's not a healthcare problem or God would have sent a doctor. The, the problem is a spiritual problem. The infection is a sin infection. And so, so God sent Jesus, God sent a savior, and he is, he is the serpent crusher, and he is the curse reverser. And in him, J.R. Tolkien says, everything sad is coming untrue. It won't fully be realized until heaven, but he wants to reverse the curse of sin in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your heart, in your thoughts. He, he wants to take something that's broken and turn it into something beautiful. He wants to reverse the curse. So as we finish up, just, I wanna remind you of what God said to Adam and Eve when they're hiding in the Garden of Eden. He, he says, where are you? He says he was walking in the cool of the garden, the cool of the evening in the garden, and that word walking, that word walking is an interesting word because it doesn't mean like it was one walk. 
the idea is that he, he did this. Like that was the custom, that he would meet Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, and they'd walk in the garden. And so in the cool of the evening, he, he goes to meet and walk with Adam and Eve. They're not there. So he says, where are you? Now, I know for some of you, when God says, where are you, you hear that in a certain voice. It's more like a, a police officer who's caught you. Where are you? Come out. Hands up. I, I, don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's the way he says it here. He says, where are you? He's concerned. He misses you. It's not how he wanted you to live your life. It's not how he created you to be. He wants to be with you. He wants to walk with you. Where are you? And some of you are hiding from God because you think he's mad and angry. But God is asking where you're at because he, because he misses you. And this is the difference that Jesus makes, that Jesus clothes us with his righteousness so that we can be reunited with God when we put our trust in him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the grace that you've given us through your son, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I thank you, Jesus, that you want to, in this church, you wanna reverse the curse of sin. In this world, you wanna reverse the curse of sin. And God, you want us as a church to be your hands and feet, that we would take on your ministry, that we would, we would be curse reversers as well. I pray, God, that if there's anyone here who is hiding, anyone here who's brought some shame, that they would leave it here, and they would come out so that they could be found by you and they could walk with you and experience the kind of life that you want them to live. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, such a, a powerful truth uh, that Kyle shared with us today, that Jesus changes everything. Uh, that when we look at the world around us, we know it's not like it's supposed to be. You know, it isn't. And when we see the brokenness in the world, we can know that one day God is going to reverse the curse that's on this planet and it's available for those that are ready to live according to that promise. Many of you joining us today are here because of something that's broken that's maybe happened to you or through you, but what I want you to know is that God's promise is available to all of us. And God's got that same question that he had for Adam and Eve, he's got it for all of us, which is where are you? Where are you in your faith journey? Are you connected with God? Are you connected to a church family? Are you connected to the creator of the universe? And so we want to come alongside you to connect with a church family near you, uh, whether that's southeast or a church body that meets where you are, uh, to receive prayer. Or if you've got questions about the next step in your faith journey, to begin that journey of allowing Jesus to reverse the curse of sin in your life, please reach out to us. You can text us or you can email us right now, and we'd love to come alongside you. Now we're going to go into a story from Iris as she shares about how Jesus reversed the curse of shame in her life and brought her healing. So why don't you take a moment and hear her full story. Here's Iris. Shame to me is a feeling that just weighs you down and you feel unworthy. You feel embarrassed. You feel like you have just done something horribly wrong and you don't know why. For me personally, I feel like, well, if I can't tell anybody else, how do I tell God? Because he, he's God, he's, he's so much bigger than everybody else. And if I can't tell even like my best friend, how do I tell the creator of the universe? Well, I grew up in in a single parent home. My biological father didn't want anything to do with me. And so that obviously made that pretty hard for my mom. And gosh, probably when I was six, five or six, she found a church to go to. And we went there through my entire childhood. They were very much more of an Old Testament church kind of. Well, I got married at a very young age. I got pregnant before I got married. I had that sense of marriage is a commitment. It's what you do, you, you fight for it, you do everything you can, you know, hard times, good times, you take it all, and you, you build the life. 
My husband at the time did not feel that way. And as it turns out, once I had the baby, he decided that life was terrible with me. And he didn't want anything to do with his child. We would fight a lot because I wanted to fight for the marriage. I was like, what, what happened? It, this is different. You, this wasn't like this before. Now we have a child and now you're being different. I don't understand. And he didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to have those conversations. He just wanted to be left alone to do whatever he wanted to do. And he would get upset. And sometimes he would hit me. Sometimes he would kick me. He'd shove me all while our child is in the next room. And one time, he bent me over backwards and choked me, tried to kill me. And it was during a really big fight and he told me that I could either let him go or he would essentially kill me and leave. And it was hard to say to anybody, this just happened to me. With my upbringing and everything, my brain said, you still fight, even though why? Why would you do that? You're fighting for somebody who can't stand you. So when I finally told my parents, one of them said, you must have done something to deserve that. Surely he's not like that. Because I hadn't told them any of the other times. They didn't know because I was ashamed. I felt, I felt like I had done something. And I had a friend and she she encouraged me to go to the police, do the police report and all that. And that, that's an experience in itself. Because they take pictures, they do all the things, and even though you know they're doing it because they have to, it's horrifying and it's embarrassing. And at that point, you literally become the statistic. And that, that was awful. Lots of prayer. It, it, was, it was all I had. It was all I had. I, I would spend hours on my knees just sometimes saying words, but mostly just crying like, why? Why did this happen to me? Why couldn't I stop it? Why couldn't I fix it? Why couldn't, why couldn't I be a successful wife, a successful mother? Because I feel like I let a kid down because now her father's not there. I, I came to know a lot more about Jesus because of that. It was, okay, this is how we love Jesus. This is what Jesus did for us. So we get to do this. We get to worship him. We, we get to celebrate this incredible thing of Jesus dying for us. And there's grace and there's mercy and there's healing. And, and that came to me when I needed it most. It's taken me a long time to not feel ashamed like I've had a, a lifetime of stuff because nobody wants to say I'm that broken and it's taken me really till just the past year year and a half to finally say there's nothing shameful about that and I'm sure I'm gonna struggle with it but right now I'm in a point where where I'm healing more than I'm feeling the shame Well, I'm really grateful and we're all grateful for the vulnerability and courage of Iris to share her story with us. And I hope it, it, it serves as a way of encouraging all of us. I love the way she ended that, that last line, I'm healing more than I'm feeling the shame. And I hope that's you. If you need to learn more about how Jesus can heal your life and can connect with you, please don't forget, you can email or text us and we'll connect you to the next best step. Other than that, I just wanna say thank you for joining us with SE Online. Uh, glad that you were here and that you spent your time with us today. Uh, we will see you same time, same place next week.